certainly amongst the sanctified this morning, because it's a holiday weekend and y'all showed up. So uh, y'all are the sanctified. You get an added blessing today for showing up. Um, but welcome to those of you. Lots of visitors in the house, students, friends of friends. I'm so glad y'all are here. There's a number of places that you could have been, but God sovereignly set you in these seats today. And he wants to do something in you before he does something through you. And a part of the gathering of the local church is saying, Lord, do something inside of me. And that's what we come here to do this morning. I want to give a special welcome to uh, the Harden family, Daryl and his wife, Sarah. He is our newest coach with player development at Georgia with men's basketball. We are glad y'all are here. Could y'all welcome them uh, with me? Amen. Glad y'all are here. Um, as well as Sarah's sister, she's in the house somewhere as well, right next to her. She is our newest uh, trainer with women's basketball, and so we are excited for you to be here with us as well. we got a lot of women's basketball fans in the house, so thank you for, for what you do. Um, real quick, a couple of things. I am super excited about what's going to happen tonight. Uh, we are starting a course, an eight-week course called A Marriage Without Regrets, and this is going to transform this church. Um, I fully believe that. I, I know that marriages are under attack. I know that marriages within this church are under attack. And Satan is doing all that he can to try to destroy the nucleus, the core of the family. But we are fighting against that. We are fighting against that. And we're doing that with the word of God. So if you're a part of that course tonight, could you just raise your hand? Uh, we have 19 couples signed up for that. 19. And so I'm so thankful for that. Just a reminder, show up a little bit early around 445. We're going to have some food for you. And then we're going to dig right in, so it's going to be great. I'm super excited about it. Also, a few weeks ago, we had a congregational meeting about the next steps for us and the, the growth of our church and new buildings, new facilities, all those things. We're putting together a survey, and you're going to get it in your inbox tomorrow. It's just going to ask you a few questions about some things we went through. I would love your feedback. Please give me your honest feedback on that, uh, on some of those questions, just to let me know your thoughts. It, it helps me think and process, helps our elder team think and process. Of, of where we're headed. So please get that, fill that out as quick as you can and get it back to us. Also, one more thing, just in light of, of being aware of, of all of our, 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 our attenders, including our small babies, we've got something called a quiet zone now, okay? That quiet zone is the foyer area. So if you slip out, of course, you've got the freedoms to do that, but just be aware that our, our kids are in there, our babies are in there, and uh, sometimes they can get a little riled up if they see others walking through or if there's a lot of noise out there. So just be cognizant of that. We want to also honor their time and make it a little bit easier for our volunteers in those rooms. Because uh, if you had been in that room, you don't know what it's like. Okay? You don't know what it's like. So let's, let's just honor that, honor that space to be a quiet zone. We've got the live stream actually on the TV if you got to go out there with your child or whatever. So just trying to be cognizant of that. So that's a, a quiet zone. We'll mention that for a few weeks just so we can kind of get that uh, in our brain. So I'm going to pray, and we're going to press into God's Word in the book of Hebrews. So God, thank you so much for the gathering again. Lord, thank you that we get to come here and hear from the Word that is inerrant, Father, that is inspired fully by you, God. We firmly believe and stand on that today. And Father, me as your servant, God, as flawed as I am, God, as as, as, as fleshly as I can be, God, as broken as I am, you still choose to put treasures in earthen vessels. You put treasure inside of clay pots, and it's just a reminder that the, the excellency is of you. It's not of me. It's not the container, but it's the content within the container. And you continually prove that, God, in these moments when I stand to exposit the word. So will you do it again? God, would you do it again? Would you speak through me to your people? They need to hear from you. We don't need another lecture. We don't need another inspirational, motivational moment, God. We need the word. We need the word. So give that to us this morning, Father. We thank you for what you've given us. We love you in Jesus' name. If you agree with that, say amen. 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 Take your Bibles, your copy of God's word. Go to Hebrews chapter 5. Uh, for those of you that don't know, we like to walk through books of the Bible we like to go line by line, verse by verse. My, my motto kind of is there's the lemon, and we're going to squeeze that lemon and get all the juice that we can out of it. And so that's what we do when it comes to God's Word. It's so rich that even in the 30 minutes that I have, we, we couldn't even begin to dig into all the truth that there is. You'd actually need an eternity to do that. And one day, if you're with Christ, you're going to have that eternity. 
Um, and so, but in these moments, we, we lay it out before you to see what the Lord has to say. So the context of, of where we're at, the overall arching theme is Jesus is greater. I say that every time because I want you to hold on to that. Jesus is greater. The summarization of the book of Hebrews is that Jesus is absolutely greater. So let's, let's look at the text in light of that this morning, starting in verse 11. We'll go 11 through 14. It says this, about this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles, the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. Verse 14, but solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. I read that from the ESV. Now, when it says about this, we have much to say, my natural question is about what we have much to say. Well, that's the context of the previous verses that we hit last week. In the days of his flesh, Jesus, he offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So the writer of Hebrews, we don't know who it was, we know it was God, but he's saying we've got much to say about the o- obedience that Jesus had through suffering on the cross. He says we've got a lot to say about Jesus being made our eternal source of salvation. We've got a lot to say about this issue of the priesthood and the order of this name Melchizedek in verse 10. But the writer has to take a purposeful pause, and he can't get to the explanation of what he's saying here in those verses Because he's concerned about the consumer. He's concerned about the one who is hearing the message. And he presses pause because he says, this is as far as we can go right now. Because I'm concerned with the consumer. I'm concerned that you can only get so much because you're only so far. So I can't hit those deeper things yet. Pause. Let me hit something else before we get to it. And that's where we land in the text today between verse chapter 5, verse 11, and chapter 6, verse 13, he deals with two things that will hinder every believer from advancing in their knowledge of God and their relationship with him, if not addressed. Here are the two things. The first is spiritual infancy. The second is spiritual apostasy. That's a fancy way of saying spiritual abandonment. Spiritual infancy and spiritual apostasy. These are two things that we all have to confront, and this is what the writer is confronting. So in verse 11, about this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. There are other translations that say you've become sluggish in hearing. There's another translation that says you have been slow to learn. There's another one that says you are too lazy to understand. Now to me, That indicates that the source of their difficulty, it doesn't reside in the complexity of the subject matter. But the reason for their infancy is on account of the fact that they have no interest in moving beyond where they are. That's the struggle. And I want to be very clear with the context and the intent of this passage here this morning. the, The writer, he's not condemning those who who are in the presence of the word, who are committed to the local church and coming, who, who listen as best they can, but maybe cognitively sometimes it's just kind of hard to, to keep up. The writer's not condemning that person. He's not dismissing those of us who struggle with our ADD sometimes. We listen and then our brains get distracted and we got to fight really, really hard to get back locked in. He's not dismissing that. He's not dismissing those who who process theology on a very simplified level. It's not that these individuals were were faithful believers who were listening carefully. They were trying hard to grasp what was being taught and being preached. They were having some difficulty maybe just understanding. That's not what he's saying. The writer is chastising those 
who should have been eagerly receiving the truth and advancing in light of that truth, but they have developed a couldn't care less attitude. That's what he's condemning in this text. Listen, being dull of hearing, it's not a problem with the ears. It's a problem with the heart. It's a problem with the heart. Verse 11 said they have become dull of hearing. The word become is super important to understand here. It indicates that they didn't start out being that way. They didn't start out being dull of hearing, but they became that way. They became dull of hearing. They became too, too lazy to even want to understand. A familiarity with this can create an apathy towards this. If it's just checking the box and just doing your thing, it, it, it can become very apathetic and very ineffective. It's, it's easy to become a passive professional listener. It's, it's, it's easy to do that, and I feel like I know a little something about that because I feel like that's what my kids are. They become professional passive listeners. It's like when I have to get on them or something about something or give them instruction or, hey, we need to do this or that, it's like, oh, here, here dad goes again. Here he goes again, and I'm just going to, like, nod and say, yes, sir. I'm, Do you hear me, Nash? Do you hear me, Spencer? Yes, sir. I, I, I hear you, but what they're really saying is, will you please be quiet so I can go do what I want to do? <laughs> like, I, I'm just going to pacify you, Dad, but I'm really waiting for you to be quiet so I can go watch SpongeBob. Like, can you, can you be quiet? But here's what I found out, y'all. They learned it from me. They learned it from me, and this is my uh, Dr. Phil moment here this morning, because I do the same thing with my wife. Mm, yes, yes, yes. Don't bow your husband next to you, wives. Don't. And the thing is, like, I'm admitting this, and she already knows this, right? She already knows. Yeah, I know you don't listen to me, right? And, and it's proof, like I was thinking about this, it's proof whenever... She gets a phone call from Colin Ferry Elementary School at 3 o'clock, and they say, hey, are you coming to pick up your children? And she's like, well, I told my husband three days ago to pick up my children today. And then I get that sweet, kind, gentle phone call. <laughs> and it's like, what happened? And here's the problem with me, y'all. I'm defending my stance. Like, I, you didn't tell me to do that. Like, I, I don't remember that. All the while thinking, she told me to do it. Like, I, I totally was not listening. I was passively listening, saying, yeah, okay, I got it. Yep, we're good. Sounds great. Yep, I'll go pick them up, whatever. But I'm not paying attention. I'm not listening at all. And my kids have picked this up from me. The truth is, in the moment when I'm getting instruction from her, I am dull in my hearing. I'm, I'm sluggish in my hearing. I'm slow to learn. I'm too lazy to understand. I don't want to be bothered. And listen, it has nothing to do with her or the content that she is delivering to me. It has everything to do with my unwillingness to actively receive it with intentions in advancing in it. It's on me. It's on us. Here's the sincere rebuke of the writer. In verse 12, he says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you, again, the basic principles of the oracles of God. Now, when he says by this time, he's, he's making it clear that you've, you've been claiming to follow Jesus for a while now. You've been claiming allegiance with Christ for a minute now. And, and by this time, something should be different in your life. You should be more mature than you are. You should be teachers by now. Now, let's avoid any confusion about the notion of, of being a teacher, because if you have been a, a student of the word, or at least a listener, in our last series, we, we talked through the book of James. You might say, hold on a second, Pastor. I, I remember you teaching the book of James, and I remember you teaching chapter 3, verse 1. In chapter 3, verse 1, it said this, Not many of you should become teachers. For you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness, for we all stumble in many ways. And maybe when you heard that and heard me preach that, you said, that's my ticket out. 
See, that's why I'm not a teacher, because the, the Bible says not many should become teachers, for we stumble in many ways. And the Lord knows I stumble, bumble, and fumble. And I don't need to be a teacher. So that, that gets me an out. So does James chapter 3 contradict with Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12? Which is it? One says not many should be teaching, and the other says, why ain't you teaching? Well, firstly, there is no contradiction between these verses. They actually coincide quite well. Because in James chapter 3, you see constructive commendation. You, you see, contextually, he's dealing with the taming of the tongue in James chapter 3. And if you're going to teach instructionally to the church, James is making it very clear that you, you need to make sure that your tongue in private aligns with your profession in public. He's saying if you're, if you're going to be a teacher in a proclam uh, proclaiming sense, then you need to make sure that your tongue is bridled. It is absolutely tame. If you can't do that, then you shouldn't be placed in a, in a role of authority within the church, in particular in a teaching role. Same admonitions apply in Hebrews chapter 5. In James, we call it the taming of the tongue. In Hebrews, we're calling it spiritual maturity. That's what we're calling it in, in Hebrews. And, and, and everyone who claims Christ should be advancing in spiritual maturity. And a sign of spiritual maturity, don't miss this, a sign of spiritual maturity is the ability to teach what you've been taught. Can you teach what you have been taught? Now, it wasn't that these were unique people in this text who, you know, should hold a unique role of teaching, but he's saying, like, you, you ought to be teachers by now in the sense that every Christian should be a teacher. There's an important sense in which every believer should be a teacher because teaching truly is a final step of learning. And we all should be that to some degree. Is the text telling everyone that they should be on stage teaching and preaching? No. Is he saying that everybody needs to be leading a Bible study? No. Is he saying that everybody needs to be leading their small group or women's ministry or men's ministry? No, he's, he's not saying that. But the text is telling the believer that if the truth you're hearing is actually transforming your life, then at minimum, you ought to be telling somebody about it. At minimum. Telling somebody about the hope that you have in Christ. You don't have to be a theologian to do that. You just got to be transformed. You just got to be surrendered. You just got to love Jesus. And you want to share that with those around you. Fathers should be teaching their families. Mothers should be teaching their children. There should be teaching in your friendships, teaching in your relationships. But the writer's got to press that pause because in verse 12, again, for, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you, again, the basic principles of the oracles of God, listen, the basic principles of God's word, they are always going to be important. We, we're always going to teach and preach that every time we proclaim God's truth. We're going to do that. No matter how a, a, advanced we get in our learning, we're going to continue to preach the basic truths of the word of God. But the basic principles of God are what we consider the foundations of what we believe and what we live. It is the foundations. The foundation is an absolute must. You have to have it, but the purpose of the foundation is to build something off of it. That is the purpose of the foundation. The neighborhoods you live in, how crazy would it be to see a foundation that's been laid and somebody comes and pokes around it every three months or so, but nothing ever gets built on it. The foundation is there for the purpose of constructing something on top of that. How firm a foundation. And that's what we build off of. And when we're building, the Bible considers that spiritual growth and maturity. You're building off the foundation of Christ, off the foundations of the word. You never, never get away from the foundation, but you build off of it. In the very same way that cognitively we start out as kids and learning our ABCs and one, two, threes. Right? We, we, we learn how to conjugate verbs. We learn how sentence structure works. We learn our, our colors and memorization and all of these things, and we grow and we're to mature from grade level to grade level. Well, how crazy would it be for us to advance into college 
and I call my son home, or I call McKinney home because she's getting ready to go to college, and I say, hey, we're going to have some friends over, we're going to have some family over, we're going to have dinner, Kendra's going to tell us all about college. And she comes and she sits down and says, you know, I'm in that lit class, I'm in English 1102 or whatever it is, and, you know, I'm learning so much, I'm so excited, and I go, Kendra, that's amazing, tell me some things you've learned. And she sits there and goes, the wheels on the bus go round and round. (laughs) And the friends are going to look at her and go, she in college? How old is she? She's 18. Are you sure? How much money y'all spending on this education? It would be insane. And it looks the same way when we claim to have been with Christ for a while, but we're still singing the wheels on the bus go round. We are to advance off of the foundations that we have. And here's the condition of the audience in verse 12, part B. He says, you need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. The writer says there's a a steady diet that you're feasting on but it doesn't fit your season of life or at least what you claim. So you've been with the Lord for a while, but you're still drinking on milk and you should be more advanced than you are. Now, if you know anything about me, you know I love food. Love food. Love good food. Uh, I'm a fan of it. Coach Goins, we went to to their house a couple weeks ago. This man threw down. I mean, it was, I was like, I don't even want him to come to my house and eat my food. I will be embarrassed. What I'm going to do is cater some food and tell him I cooked it. That's what I'm going to have to do. I love good food. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Porter House before. Y'all been to Porter House? Right up the street, right? Some of the best steaks in town. Delicious. I actually, just to uh, tease you all, I, I put the, I'm going to put the menu on the screen. Oh, oh. We got a little she crab soup, absolutely delicious. If you hadn't tried it, you should get it. The salads are great, nice and crisp. The, the jumbo lump crab cakes, so good, right? I, when I go to steakhouse, I don't really want chicken. I'm jumping down to the steak, right? Filet mignon, anybody like a good filet? Medium rare? Yeah, Gordon Ramsay would say medium rare. You got to throw it out. <laughs> New York strip, the blue filet, surf and turf, bone and ribeye, so, so good. So good. Anybody hungry yet? Yeah. So let's just say me and my wife, we go to Porterhouse. The waiter brings out this menu. Says, hey, we got some great stuff here. We even got a menu that's on the side. Got some specials tonight. I look it over. Just absolutely delicious. But I'm just, I'm going to go to my wife and say, babe, you know what? I think I'm just going to have my regular. I don't really want that steak. Let me just, let me just go. Filet, nah, don't need it. It's just, I'm just whipping up my meal here. Y'all excuse me for a second. I'm just getting my food. Yeah, all right, there we go. Yeah, y'all steaks look real good. They smell great too, but nah, you know I'm good. Let me just get what I want here. All right, all right. He thought I was going to drink it, didn't he? <laughs> like, is he going to drink that? Is he really going to do it? Is he really going to do it? Can you imagine, go to Porter House, and I pass up on all of that, and I want this instead. Unfortunately, this is the way a lot of the church looks today. A lot of the church looks today. And even a lot of people who stand in my position, they discredit your ability to ingest solid food, and they feed you this. Because they think that's all you can handle. And we got to entertain you. We got to get you here. We got to do the smoking lights and the mirror and the big festivities. And it's all wrapped up in our facilities and all these things because we got to find a way to keep you sucking on that bottle. Because if you're a baby, then you got to keep coming back to us because you can't do anything for yourself. We're not teaching you how to study the word for yourself. We're not pressing you into deeper things and understanding theology and soteriology and epistemology and all these things because we go, uh, that's for the elites, that's for the seminarians. Give me the bottle instead. I refuse to be that kind of preacher at Life Church of Athens. I trust that we're going to start here, but we ain't going to stay here. 
We're going to grow and advance because that is what the scriptures call us to. It's what the word of God is calling us to, is to, to advance in our maturity, to grow and to be developed. Now, this does play a role. First Peter tells us this in chapter 2, verse 2. It says, like newborn infants, desire pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow up into your salvation. Milk, spiritual milk, serves a purpose, right? Spiritual milk is good for the beginning stages of of life. It's it's needed in order to gain strength, to gain maturity. It is the only diet suitable for infants. But it's inadequate to sustain the life of a grown human being. It's inadequate. The text allows us to start out on the milk, but it does not allow us to stay there. Verse 14 says, but solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Let's deal with the first part of that verse there. Solid food is for the mature. So maturity has everything to do with combining the inward progressions with outward connections. Inward progressions with outward connections. Think about the body for just a second. In a natural, healthy situation, the body desires to grow beyond where it is. The body naturally desires to do that. Inward maturity, it is a natural progression. Your hands grow, your feet grow, your legs grow, arms, your organs grow. All these things internally, they naturally grow. But just because there is inward maturity doesn't mean that there is outward maturity. Outward progression, it is fostered through outward connections. That's why farmers, when they need oxen, they'll pair up a young oxen with an old. Because the young one's got the strength to pull the load. But the older one knows how to pull the load. Big difference. And those two are paired by the farmer because that strength is needed. That energy is needed, but that wisdom is also needed. That's the beauty of the local church. We don't just say, hey, we're gearing towards a younger generation and that's it. Or we're just gearing towards an older generation and that's it. No, we're gearing towards everybody because we need everybody. (laughs) And that's what the gospel does. Everybody is needed in the body of Christ. And when we look at this according to scripture, Titus 2 really speaks to this of how the church is supposed to work, the body of Christ. Titus 2, starting in verse 1, it says, You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderous or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, working at home, to be kind, to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God, malign the word of God. Verse 6 says, similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything. Set them an example by doing what is good, and your teaching show integrity, seriousness, and sound of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about you see the marriage between the two, the necessity for the old and the young, the mature and the immature? We have to do this together. There's an inward natural progression that your body wants to get to, but you need the outward connections and maturity to tell it where to go to. That's what the body of Christ does. That's how we advance from just milk to more solid foods. So let me ask you a question this morning. Where should you be by this time? Sermon title was by this time, where should you be? Think inwardly. Where should you be by this time? Now, for some of you, this is where you should be. This is new for you. This is an infancy stage for you. You're not quite ready for the solid food. You you need this. You need the connections. You need the milk of the word. This is where you are. And this is where you should be for this season of life. But one thing my kids always did when they were babies, when I was eating, they were quick to reach their hand over into my plate. And ain't nothing faster than the hand of a baby. I'm going to tell you right now. They were quick to desire what mommy and daddy were eating. They couldn't have it yet, but they wanted it. 
They were on milk, but they didn't want to stay there. Have an appetite for more mature food that can grow you. For those who have claimed faith for a while, you fit the description of the text. Are you still on milk? Which you should be on more solid food. Here's a few indicators that you might still be a babe on milk. Let's look at natural babies for a second for this, this imagery. Babies are unstable. They can't stay up on their own. They got the bobble head, right? You got to hold their neck. They're totally unstable. Is your life unstable? Are you tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine according to Scripture in Ephesians 4.14? Are you over here one second and then over there one second? You say, I'm going to be solid. I'm going to get after this thing. I'm going to crush this sin in my life. And then one thing happens and you're totally opposite of what you committed to. Are you unstable? If so, you might still be on milk. Babies, they need a crib of their own. They've got their space. Do you stick to your own space and avoid community at all costs? Do you make excuses why you can't get connected to the body of Christ, why you can't be consistent in fellowship? If so, you might still be on the milk. Babies are very territorial. No in mind are two words you don't have to teach your kids. Do not have to teach them that. So this is mine. This is my toys, my blanket, my church, my ministry, my preferences. Babies need a lot of sleep. Are you spiritually asleep? Is it hard for you to wake up and be spiritually aware and spiritually cognizant? Babies get cranky if they don't get what they want. Are you easily offended and cranky with people? Do you villainize those who disagree with you? Are you offended by somebody who has maybe checked you on something and it was rightly deserved, but you got offended and you said, I'm done with that? If so, you might still be on milk. As we finish this morning, if you fit into those categories that I just mentioned, You might ask, well, how in the world do I get beyond spiritual infancy then? How do I get beyond it? Because I acknowledge that might be where I am, that might be where I'm struggling, that might be what I'm dealing with. How do I advance beyond it? And here's my answer. Come back next week. Because we're going to dig into that next week, if the Lord allows. But for now, I want us to take an honest inventory of, of where we are spiritually in our walk with Jesus. Don't think about your neighbor. Don't think about your spouse. Don't think about the person in front of you, behind you. Where are you at in terms of your spiritual maturity? Where are you at today? Verse 14, but solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Good from evil. Spiritual maturity helps you know what to consume and what not to consume. Babies don't know that. Babies see it and they want it. They think it's appetizing. They think they can put it in their mouth. Everything they find, they're sticking it in their mouth. Babies can't discern that. But those who want to grow and advance in your walk with Jesus, what's the scriptural benefit of that? You get to distinguish good from evil. Discernment is the benefit of spiritual maturity. Maybe we fall into evil, into sin, because we're just not spiritually mature enough and discerning. But you don't have to stay there. You can grow and advance. The Lord has set up incredible tools by which we can do that. But here's the thing. It doesn't manifest itself in isolation. It doesn't. That's why we have to be connected. That's why the things that we do and we push in terms of our groups and connectivity and relationships and go to coffee with each other, build relationships with one another, because you need it. That other individual can help you maturely grow in advance and say, hey, listen, I I know you're struggling to maybe eat some of that food that's on the menu that's being served up, but let me help cut that up for you, right? It's amazing what babies can eat when we cut it up for them. Baby can eat some chicken, but you got to cut it up. You might even have to puree it. There's a way to consume it. 
But those who are more spiritually advanced, they know how to make that meal palatable. But they're also saying, hey, come on, come on, let's let's put this down. I want you to grow. I want you to mature. Come on, you can eat it. Here, here comes the choo-choo train. It's coming in, right? We're, we're, we're feeding you. That's what we do as a local church. I'm going to ask the prayer team if they would come, come up this morning. <clears throat> This is another means by which we can help each other advance in our spiritual growth and maturity. Prayer. Prayer. Praying with one another. It's connecting our faith with those around us. It's not that we've got this thing nailed down in perfection. It's not that those of us that are standing on stages or proclaiming have have all the things figured out. That we're just eating steak every single day but we got an appetite for it. And by the grace of God, he continues to supply our every need. The old timers, when I was growing up, they used to sing a hymn that said, bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. So gracious God, we come before you, the bread of life, asking that you would feed us. Father, you've been a God of provision from the very beginning. As Pastor Mark mentioned earlier, God, you've got a way of doing that, and it's extraordinary. It's exciting, but it does require a level of faith and trust to say, God, even though I might not be able to see you, even though I might struggle to hear you, I still trust you, just as a baby would trust their parents. Father, we trust you. God, would you help us today? Father, help us to grow in advance even this week in our time of study, our time of prayer, our desire and longings for you. God, give us the desire for the meat of the word. Father, you know if there's someone here today that does not know you, they don't have a relationship with you, Father. They've been ingesting the junk of the world. Father, would you help them to be enlightened today to the truth of your word, to turn that plate down to the junk of this world and to say, I want substantive food that is going to satisfy me, and that is only found in you, Jesus. May they come to know that today. God, would you save them? That's you this morning. I'd love to talk with you about that. I'll be in the back. Let's, let's have that conversation about the gospel and how it is transformed. So, Father, God, your people, we love you. Thank you for the word in Jesus' name. Amen. If you stand with me and the spirit of prayer, uh, come if you feel led. The altar's here. You can kneel. Just have that moment with the Lord as we continue to worship. 